please. Hi, everyone. Nice to have you back. Um, we've been really interested in your assignments. And I want to remind you that if you intend to get a Credly badge, you need to do the assignments. And um, someone contacted me yesterday to say that uh, assignment one was closed, but I've opened it. I think I've opened them all so that um, you can still reply to them and we'll get them. If that's not the case, let me know. And my email is down here at the bottom, c2cc at conservation-us.org. If you have a problem with your password, you can contact the info address here. And um, I, I do have one request. When you do your assignments, please put your name on them, because we can't always tell who they're from. Although you are getting the, the, the computer interface, it does record who you are, but I don't see who you are. OK, so I'm going to turn this over to Mark Wemling. He is our, our course coordinator. So go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Susan. And welcome, everybody, once again. Our speaker today is Brent Powell. Brent has been involved in the collection career profession since 1984. He has held positions in museums, as well as in the fine arts services industry. He is currently holding the position of a relocation and protection field supervisor at Crozier Fine Arts here in the Washington, DC area. Outside of his employment career, he has been active in the professional development aspects of the industry. Brett was the chairman of Packin from 1991 to 1999 and served a second term from 2008 to 2013. Currently, he is a member of the advisory committee to the Packin Board of Directors. He is the author of the book Collections Care, an illustrated handbook for the care and handling of cultural objects, came out in 2015, and is currently writing a new book titled Principles in the Care of Handling Cultural Objects. I'd like to thank, thank you for joining us today, Brent, and we look forward to your presentation. OK, thanks, Mark, Susan, Mike. Um, I'd like to just go ahead and start. Um, um, and Mark gave me enough of a background of my experience and stuff, but uh, I've done several webinars over the years on different subjects, and uh, even some with uh, connecting to collections care a few years ago. So you can always look back on those if you want some more interest of where I'm coming from within the profession. But uh, I got into the profession after I got out of graduate school back in the late 80s and uh, ended up in um, working for a commercial fine art service company and then went into the museum side where I actually got, you know, got learned uh, the ropes and such, which was the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. So any of the Midwestern people know that institution. That's where I grew up. So anyway, you can always look, and like Mark said, there's other things, but you can always look online or uh, look at my website, which I'll be putting in the handout. And the other parts of my handout will be coming. Susan can explain that. So anyway, I'm currently, I've been a consultant here for the last few years, but I'm now actually on site here in Washington with this project. Uh, working at the Air and Space Museum, uh, re dealing with the relocation. Because one of my experiences, a really large part of my experience over the years, is managing mu museum relocation. So I'm constantly dealing with equipment and such. And this is what, um, when Mark asked me to do this, I you know, started digging through my slides and slides, and that dates me. Uh, started going through uh, everything I had looking for everything. This this picture here I'd just like to include because it's from a uh, uh, bunch of images we got for a preparators conference in Fort Worth talking about the history of, uh, of uh, the industry. So, so anyway, the subtitle of this uh, talk is Handling Equipment for the Safety of the Object and Handler in Mind. 
and as I, you can read through these, but I'll just talk in general to them. But it's always about getting things safely, handling objects safely from point A to point B. Point A to B could be across the room or be across the world, and of course, returning. So we're always there in a collection care issues, preventing the protective care, preventative conservation, a lot of times it's termed. And, and we're always dealing with the inherent properties and integrity of the object. But at the same time, uh, the handler's responsibility is to move an object must be using proper handling techniques to assure their physical well-being from damage. So the handlers uh, are, are dealing with these things, know how to you know, use proper equipment and the, the ergonomics and the OHS safety issues with this proper equipment will help save them as well because, uh, you know, if you've known anybody that's worked in this industry for any amount of time, you know, you'll hear back, you know, back problem stories. You know, they hurt their back, and here's how they did it, so on and so forth. So I'll be addressing this while I'm going through it because it's always been one of my favorite topics, and I've had my, you know, share of back operations, and I can date back to certain things that I was lifting out and over, like, you know, reaching, you know, one time I threw my back out really bad with lifting a set of bronze andirons out over a storage area just to get them to the point. People putting objects onto pedestals from your lift, this sort of thing. You know, it's like you still have that point where you have to physically move the object, but it might be four feet up in the air. So you're using your upper back instead of your lower back, all these sort of things. But handling equipment uh, we'll deal with. So we focus so much on the safety of the object that we sometimes mentally address these physical needs of the handler. So if you've got questions afterwards, because I'll be covering a lot of this, I won't be going into specifics per object, this sort of thing, but I'll be referencing things. I'll be referencing the type of equipment. But look at those things and ask me. Feel free. You'll have my contact details and stuff. Ask because it's always been one of my favorite things, and I'm living proof with my back injuries and <laughs> as I've gotten older. Because I, I grew up on a farm, we did it, you lifted everything, I'm a big guy, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, as you get older, and I was about 45, then things started falling apart, and a lot of it was because of the handling issues. So I had to learn better ways of using leverage, equipment, so on and so forth. So I'm very pro-lifting, quality lifting materials and pro-ergonomics within the industry. So, so anyway, the two must go hand in hand so success and knowledge of how properly care for objects, keep staff responsible, healthy, and able to do their job. Because I had several staff over the years that, you know, were out. They were pretty much on permanent disability. And so that's, and they were senior people. And it was always kind of hard because then I could only give them, you know, management jobs or paperwork jobs to help me out when they were coming back because they shouldn't lift lifted that object. So anyway, this presentation, installation of object handling equipment will address the various equipment types and related handling procedures. So the scenarios that I'm presenting will just address proven practices within the museum and the commercial work environment because both go hand in hand. When I first got in this industry in the late 80s, there was kind of more of a separation between the two, but now both work hand in hand for collection care, and both have incredible amounts of knowledge that differ from each other. So it's really good to bring the two together. A uh, special focus will also address the current OHS standards, safety training attributes, and personal quality. quality. I'm getting some feedback now. Is anybody else? Okay. Materials used to protect the object is another webinar within itself. That's the main focus is going to be on handling equipment. Now, in my earlier document, I put in there about dealing with materials, but the more I wrote this, I was going, you know, I just can't cover the materials. I'll be talking about materials, but I'm not going to address materials as a subject. So there'll be times. So 
I want you, if you read the bottom of this slide, the bottom of this image, take notes and research specifics. So I'll address that in a second. But as we're going through, the facts are the following images are commonly used handling equipment within museums and, of course, commercial companies. All equipment varies in design and function, even though a lot of them are similar. But they all have their specific design and function. And you have to be aware not to push the limit, you know, not to, to understand the limits and understand what you're dealing with. Because otherwise, you'll have something will go wrong and the machine will break down, your object will get damaged, a potential risk, or the person moving that object and using that equipment could get hurt. So equipment that we'll be addressing is customized or original design. Sometimes the original design, you buy it from the manufacturer, you buy it off the shelf, to use that term. You know, you go to the warehouse companies and so on and so forth online and look and, you know, here's a warehouse truck or this sort of thing. Or even up to equipment like scissor lifts and forklifts, you can deal with them. When I first got in this, you know, 30 years ago, we made a lot of things to adapt to the forks on the forklift or walkie stack or that. But we were really bridging the um, liability of that machine and our liability of handling. But we always tried to overbuild, and that's all great. But as years have gone by, uh, we've got also got into more complete custom design. I'll show you some really great stuff from the National Gallery in London. My friends over there that built this stuff, designed it out. And when I've had to make it, whether it was when I was in Australia or back here in the States, I had to get somebody to engineer it. And I paid almost as much sometimes to get it engineered as I did to get it built. Because then, when we, if we had a problem, the museum or the company that I was working with didn't have the liability issues which occur if something gets damaged, and especially if it's from of equipment use. Because again, each piece of equipment varies in design and function. Uh, proper equipment provides safe object handling. Proper equipment provides staff safety. Well, I've said this before. I'll repeat this as I go through, because it's just fact. Um, but also, again, I'm showing you images and talking. So if you see an image you like, take a note you know, and say, like, well, this walkie stacker, so on and so forth, we could use that. Or that's a comment he made about this. Because I didn't want to put a lot of verbiage in here because there's so much to talk about. It's kind of like the materials. Where do you stop? So I've just pretty much got images that I'll be talking through the specifics of these pieces of equipment. The other thing is when you're dealing with a vendor that's selling you this equipment, you can always have it brought out to the site and you know, ask them to bring it outside, especially if you're spending a lot of money like a forklift or a hydraulic lift or you know anything that's going to be quite valuable, you uh, need to know this. The other fact is make sure you get the proper training of the staff for these specialized pieces of equipment. Because that's a liability. I mean, I'm going through some things here at the Air and Space just the last few days I started, and oh, my God. There's, you know, working 40, 50 feet up in the air, moving an airplane, rigging it down, and all the things we've got to deal with. Oh, my God. You know, it's not, you know, nothing simple. So we're going through all this oh and training, and people are getting trained, and we're getting our certification, so on and so forth. But back to the reality of what we're all dealing with and what you're dealing with, your specific institution, and again, I'll be talking about specific institution is you have your space, you have your needs for the type of equipment, you'll have your space that you're running the equipment through and materials you need to lay down for floor protection, so on and so forth, your point loads on your floor loading and so on and so forth, your elevator rating, all this sort of stuff will be run across. But everything's geared for your specific needs. Like when I do consulting work for an individual museum and dealing with uh, and they're in particulars and writing manuals for them and stuff. Just this last weekend, I was down at Crystal Bridges in, in um, Bentonville, Arkansas, and dealing with their things, it was 
was focusing on what they needed, what their staff needed, what their space was, so, you know, pathways, all this sort of stuff. So everything's kind of like your institution specific, even though a lot of them overlap. You can go down to another museum, so I'm familiar with this card, but, you know, there's a lot of issues in a particular museum. So let me move on. So customized tool cards. It's always been one of my favorites. This is one I designed when I was at the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne for the relocation of the collection coming back into two museums, two buildings, I should say, but two different name museums. One was dedicated just to Australian art. It was a new building. The other was dedicated to international art. But we had seven teams. They all had to have equipment. Before, they just had a few carts, and they didn't have equipment marked, anything, so on and so forth. So came up with the design. You can see that it's a mess inside, but most all tool carts are a mess, unless you get somebody that's real you know, fussy about their tool cart, which they should be. But anyway, this one's a mess. But in this cart, you can see the compartments on the top shelf, various things. Bottom shelf, you can see some. Um, suction glass, uh, swirl tape, roll, this sort of stuff, with Velcro, so on and so forth. But on top, see this off to the left where that green tape measure is and a pair of gloves? That was a folding lid that we came up with that folded over the top of the equipment storage there. And that way, we had a table to work on, and you can directly get at your equipment, cabinet doors locked, so on and so forth. When you weren't using the table on top, you simply folded it back over onto that, and then you had this large handle opening, which also served as a trash bag holder. So, you know, as you're dumping materials, you all know, you know, the tape, trash, dirty gloves, all this stuff could go in there. So we had a uh, rolling trash bin on our carts. And it's it's something that, you know, there's a variety of them out there. There's a variety, of, you can go on the packing site and see a variety of tool carts and stuff. But, you know, then figure out your need and then go from there. But it's always something customized that is most efficient. And you'll see these things on different cards, how people have actually put tool cards on A-frames or painting frames and, and different things as we go through here. But anyway, you can buy a lot of this right online, commercial tool cards. And these images might not be too good because I pulled them directly off the uh, website for the company, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that already exists. And you can make things out of it. It's like you know Rubbermaid carts. You can buy those fairly reasonable, and they've actually got them now where you can actually different type of wheels or casters. But basic Rubbermaid cart, you can't you can't make it that cheap as you, cheap as you can buy it. But you can modify it. You can modify it by putting a foam pad in the bottom of the cart top, you can put padded rails around it, you know, have to foam and cut them so there's padded rails, and you got a little bit better object cart. But here, you can take and add some things on, like this one to the left is great because it's got a place for the ladder, it's got the paint shelves, and all this stuff. You can adapt some of that, because you might don't, not want, you might even put little walls around that so you don't have things fall off the shelves, this sort of stuff. But what I'm trying to get at with this slide or this image is the fact that you know commercial tool cards are available. There's things that uh, the old term or usual term is called gang boxes. Gang boxes are big metal boxes. They're like almost, if you're not familiar with them, picture like a small trash can that you roll out to the trash dumpster, picking it up, unloading, and then you roll it back into your workspace. But they, they've got gang boxes. They lock up. Uh, there's a, one slide here I've got that is for exhibitions is really good, which is it will be coming up as a uh, thing to uh, card to open for, open cart that you can actually uh, can put objects in and lock it up. It's you know it's a see-through screen in cart, really cheap, really reasonable. But then you can adapt it by you know changing and adding foam. For your protective barrier, support barrier, you can lock it up. You can, you know, images on. You can cover it up. Whatever. Um, one of the things you'll find 
such a variety, and I love looking at what people came up with is work table and supply cards. Uh, of course, you can buy commercially by folding tables and such, and they're great in their place, and you can tie off the locking mechanism with some twill tape or some sort of banding, you know, just to so it doesn't collapse on itself. But most good work tables, one, need to be mobile, need to have locking casters, rollers as you're moving them around. The other thing is, like the one here on the left, you need to have the surface be able to have a covering over it, like a clean, clean white muslin or cotton covering. White, no matter who you talk to, whether a conservator or a storage or up on exhibition, any white material, covering it with a foam core and such. I prefer using cloth materials just because I can tear them off and replace them, and it's cheap. So things get dirty. Uh, you can replace them quite easily, staple them back on, but in your design, figure out a way to make them reusable. You can also use cardboard on top, and not archive. I'm just talking about regular acidic cardboard because it's a work surface. But, you know, you're cutting a lot of stuff, mat night or foam cutter, and you cut into that cardboard top. Well, you can replace that by simply putting another layer of cardboard on, on it. Nelson Atkins, we had a big rolling table similar to like this one on the left, and we'd get up to where we'd have like, you know, 10 or 12 layers of cardboard on it, and we thought, well, we better replace it. You go pull it off, it was like a big spongy cracker because it was all cut up. But the thing was, it was a cheap way to cover it. It was a cheap way to make it clean. Putting this muslin or white cotton sheeting on, cheap, easy, keeping it clean. With it being white, you can see if something is chipped off of your object or if something's dirt on there. You can see things. That's you know, It's like the old days when white gloves were the preferred glove. The best thing about it was you could see when they got dirty. The blue nitro or black nitro gloves we use today, you don't really see them getting dirty as quickly. But anyway, the other thing with this like table on the left, you can make compartments. You can have doors on this. You can put doors on it. You can put uh, your equipment storage in there, take your material supplies, your tools and stuff, and then making another tool cart, which is part of your table. So those are the ideas. The one on the right is inevitable. Quantity materials are sold in rolls. So you need the rolls type system. And this is a great simple rack system on the right, and uh, it works quite well. Now you can purchase these already pre built and stuff like metal carts on any warehousing company. And that's good. But if you have needs, or like on this one here, you've got different types of materials that you didn't, you know, you can, you can make this. If you've got a carpenter shop that can make it, they can do it cheaply. You know, I've seen people take apart old crates and turn them into rolling um, uh, uh, roll material storage. And all they did was slap uh, wheels underneath, casters underneath, so on and so forth. While I'm saying, oh, sorry, and in this slide on the right, image on the right, lower left-hand corner is C-bins. C-bins are just a common uh, large cardboard bin. Uh, that you can put on a dolly or make a little flat top dolly, put them on, and roll things around. They're great for materials because, you know, you're not handling, you're just rolling the cardboard box around. But the other point I want to make before I move on, and this pertains to most all equipment, is getting locking casters. Now, you can get, you know, 360-degree locking casters, that, you know, so they swivel around and then you lock them into place uh, so they go straight or they, they're totally swivel. But it all depends on whether size, especially size of the table or the movement you're making, the car you're moving. But a lot of times, like I prefer two straight wheels, two swivels. That way I can direct it more. But that's, say, like for a small tool cart or something, that's better for me because I can direct that around easier. But if you're using it to put objects on, rolling up to the space, or you need to go, do a 90 degree sweep, move into an elevator, move it a little bit to the left, the roll complete 
uh, rolling cast is good. But locking them in place when you're working on them, then you're stable, so on and so forth. So, painting and frame cards. Now, I'm going to show you a variety of these, and you'll see any place you travel to and you look at frame cards. Everybody's got a little bit different one. That's in there, and they're custom again, custom made to what you need. And there's a variety. This one on the left, uh, we used at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, and we built it in house. And because we used a lot, moved a lot of small framed items up for you know when we we're doing permanent collection changeovers and stuff. This worked well because it had the, the vertical uh, angles inside, so you could do some stacking frames. Also, it was small, easy to move um, handles. And my carpenter was really a cabinet man. He made all our display cases and stuff, so he had the love of this, you know, making a really nice cabinet guard. The one on the right, you can see the white one is uh, really a traditional old cart with more of the single vertical back. Load things on the front of it. You don't really, you can't load anything on the back because it's the way it's structured. But you know, this helps to load up heavier objects, you know, and, and such. This is National Gallery in Washington's art that I took up years ago, and it's just a nice, plain, simple card. And they had dozens of them around, and they're just good cards. But again, they're, they're the simple needs when you're talking about frame cards and such. Then you get into more customization and such. And these two are from the recent visit I had at uh, uh, Crystal Bridges Museum. And the thing I liked about them, this, this is an old, the one on the right you can see with the, with the moving blanket on. It's an old traditional car, you know, straight up T type frame, of a, you know, upside down T uh, frame. You can see on the padding on the lower level on both cards, you know, there's that small pad. There's a little ridge block, a little uh, bridging block, so you can shove things out if you need, not, you know, helping to keep things from slipping out. But the point I want to emphasize on these two cards is how they've adapted them for other needs. So the one on the left is a great example of how they put on an extension that goes up. And that way, you can get larger paintings on it and such, and be able to support the upper uh, brace or upper support of a painting, catch it being adjusted to fit the size. Because not every day you're going to be using something that's smaller than, say, this four and a half feet, five foot tall center part of the T. But in this, also, you can see that opening in the middle, and they've draped a blanket over it. We've got the pads off the side. It's just a really great example of a simple cart that's been adapted to help accommodate a variety, variety of objects. One on the right, the other thing I like about this is that customized, if you, if you pull it up, when you get the image a little closer, you can pull it up and see where the moving blanket, the regular moving blanket that you buy has had Sewn into the edges. Um, let me see if I can draw it out here. Anyway, it's the way they've attached it. Oops, working. Anyway, I'll just leave that arrow alone. I don't want to stop sharing, Mark. Oh, oh there you go. Uh, Hold on. Anyway, right here, there you go, right there. Thank you, whoever's doing that. Is right there, you can see where they've tied this together. It's like sewn, like, you know, laces into a shoe, but they made it so that they can sew it together and then take it off. You can simply take it off and replace it or wash it. Uh, but my experience talking about materials and moving blankets is you can wash a moving blanket. But you got to take it to a commercial washer, and usually they're about almost as expensive as replacing with new. So 
but you need to keep them clean. They do get dirty, but if you got some sort of commercial washer, you can wash them in house. They take forever to dry, even though you got a dryer. But you also can replace them fairly reasonably. But anyway, these are two really good examples of painting frame carts that adapted. Now we're getting into more specific painting and frame carts. And the one on the left is a really large cart, and it's another National Gallery cart here in Washington. And you can tell that by seeing all the blue crates in the room. But uh, this one uh, is very heavy duty. It's, it's made out of metal. It's got a very strong structural base to it and extra heavy wheels uh, to carry the different loads and such. And um, very nice cart. The ones on the right uh, were from our move at National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne when we were moving back into the buildings because we put what would we do is we load out the items onto these carts, like these big carts. You can see that they're aluminum, but you can see the vertical um, ribs, as I call them, in there uh, because what we did is we'd load them in storage put them on the truck loaded, secure the cart loaded cart to the truck, then unload and move the things to the site, uh, and then unload the, the cart. So we had a lot of these. They were very expensive to build, but they adapted. So you can see that one large painting in the middle, not a real good example because it's just sitting on there. but. If that when that was being transported, it'd be tied off, headed off. You can see clear to the left. There's a cart full of painting uh, travel frames that are tied off, so on and so forth. But the thing is, you could tie to the wrap ratchet strapping to these vertical uh, uh, bars in the piece, so it was very nice to. Um, tie them off and hold them in place. Um, also on the bottom rail, the front rail had a opening which if you needed to go vertical with your strapping and you could tie it down there. They also had this wonderful, you wanted to tie two carts together, you could tow them, but I never hardly ever towed two together. So it's one of those ideas when they design them, oh, we put a ring on it, we can tow them. Great idea, not functional. Of course, because you can't control moving them around. But these cards had you know, complete swivel wheels, lockable, so on and so forth. They were heavy, but we had enough of them. We could move them back and forth empty because it took you know three years of moving things to and from sites. But it decreased the amount of time tremendously for handling objects when you have to go from an off-site storage to an on-site storage, so on and so forth. But you have to make sure you can secure that loaded, secured cart to the side of your truck securely. So there's those issues in design. So this is one of my favorite carts, another National Gallery of London <coughs> cart painting frame cart, and it's because it's got so many varieties of essential things. So whoever's running the pointer, if they could point down toward the base of this cart, you can see down below, clear on the bottom, in between the wheels, thank you, there's a space, and this, this little compartment's just for foam blocks. Now you think, well, that's awfully low. And Go over, go over an entrance or something and scrape, but their floors and stuff can adapt to it. The other one they had, the wheels were higher so you could get more internal space. Then if you take it, if you can take the arrow clear to the right on the bottom, to the, below the handle, right there, that's a drawer that they put in. And in that drawer, they had supplies. Because you never know going what, what you're going to need. And then, of course, the handle right above there is a pretty common handle, and you got a good grip. You do your choreography of a heavy load. You know, you can both put your right hand up, your left hand down, or whatever. 
choreography is really bracing and holding that the weight on this piece. And of course, then the, the top of the cart raised up at a telescoping top, moved up and down, and that was locked in. It was a great, great, great multiple cart. Now, they came up with the design. They used it. They had a lot of them made. It was constantly being used in the, the building. Here it is in action. It's just got an open frame on it, but it's up in the gallery. And you can see better, if you look down at the base again, you can see better that drawer, the handle, you can see how they tied it off, so on and so forth. But these were used daily and very nice. But they spent some money on them. They, they spent them quality. They're going to have them for years. That's one thing I always laugh, like going back to Nelson Atkins. I started there in 87. When I go back, I was just back a few months ago talking to him. I'm having him do some work for me, taking images for this new book. And here's some old carts that, you know, are still got our stamps on them. And here's some old stencils. And stuff. And it's like, well, why wouldn't you keep it? I, I inherited it when I came there from the previous guy. So, you know, quality is maintained. And when you do your budgets and stuff for new equipment, if you do your research and you get them out good and quality, then people really take effect. Uh, transit crates. Now, these are very more common in Australia, and they're good for commercial uh, use. Because, again, it's the idea of let's load up the cart, roll it onto the truck, Load it up in the gallery, load it on the truck, drive it, take it, support it into the truck, unload it um, at site, and then you've got to make. So you're now handling the things. It drives me crazy when it's like you have to unload large paintings or a bunch of paintings, especially. You know, I mean that's why you see a lot of people, commercial companies, use C bins, pack and stack, stack inside with C-bins are put inside of the truck, but, but you can brace it off, tie it off with a C-bin. These are a little bit more durable because one, they're wooden, uh, they got the wheels, the foam and liner, and you know, I'll show the next slide shows the way they stack inside. But again, the purpose was to load up these, load up this two-dimensional stuff. And you could even get three-dimensional stuff in there, but you loaded it up, and you put the, the outside door on, which, as you see, and, and to the left of each, or sorry, to the right of each slide, there's a lock, a slide lock, piston lock, they're called. And you can, you know, push that in, and you put it into your metal plate, and it held things in place. But you're limited to size, and then some of these got bigger. So these were about 48 inches wide in length and about 24 deep, but uh, and about uh, four foot tall. So we were making these, and we built hundreds of these things. I mean, literally hundreds, because people would store stuff in. And uh, International Art Services in, in, in Australia, who I work for, my wife and I were private owners in that company, but we would ship these all over the country, much like Artex does here with shipping things all over the country. And you'd put these things in, and, you got used to taking places. It just made so much less headache of handling. So again, the collection care, more or less handling, so on and so forth, is great. But you can see the one on the left, the wrap painting, you know, you know, bubble wrap, foam wrap, whatever. In between the paintings were dividers. That thing we came up with corrugated plastic. You know, it's like corrugated uh, cardboard, but corrugated sheet plastic because it's more durable. And I'm a huge fan of corrugated materials in any sense. And they can be used very similar to cardboard. Not cardboard, the paper corrugated. Because that folds and cuts and bends differently than the corrugated plastic. But very good for dividers, clean, you know, very sturdy, and outlast the, the paper corrugate on, say, like an 8-cent mill D-flute corrugate. Anyway, these transit carts are very good. And you can put three-dimensional objects in them, 
spray the objects and break them off. But you'd have to do a little tying or you'd have to do padding in between the, the door, this outside wall that came in that you pushed up against it. But there was ways to deal with it. But again, the purpose was not handling the object. Now this next slide, I'm going into the essentials. Dollies, J-bars, two-wheelers, flatbeds, and pallet jacks. Everybody's got them. Everybody uses them. But there's varieties amongst them. So I'm going to go through this. and You can take your notes of this because sometimes there will be different things you can do. But when you're buying them, buy quality or have quality ones made. Because each one of these has wheels on them. Each one of them will last longer. You know, in the commercial companies, I mean, I work for Crozier in New York here, and so many people, they would, you know, people would load, come to the truck, and they'd always, another shipper would take them away, and, and even our guys would on the trucks would, he just picked them up by somebody else. So they would always try to buy cheaper dollars because they were buying them by the hundreds, and they were losing them by the fifties, you know. So it was quite, quite miserable because you couldn't buy quality equipment. But you, you fix it. So we had this place we called Dolly Graveyard well, off to the side, and you fix the things. But anyway, on the slide on the left is the Dolly, a J-bar, and then a paddle jack. The slide on the right, you see the stair climber, a two-wheeler. And to the immediate right, you see the uh, more standard warehouse two-wheel truck with flat-top dollies hanging on, and then the green piece that's angled up in the upper right-hand corner of the picture, oftentimes you'll see it called skates. And what it is is just a, a dolly that's got straight wheels on it and you put a very heavy load on that. So thanks for the arrow, by the way. So standard dollies. Standard dollies, uh, the two on the left in the slide, you'll see the dimensional image, which is really good because when this slide was made, uh, it described each dolly, and, you know, height, width, so on and so forth. So the one on the left with the black stripes on, the rubber strapping was put on, it's a flat top dolly, but it's got the open center. And so that way you can put anything flat on, it's not going to rock. And it's say if you got like a skid on the crate, you can set that skid to the open area. The one on the right gives you two points of rubber contact. Uh, you can set it on there, and that's really nice because then it doesn't slide. So almost all dollies you'll see have either a rubber surface, which helps the dolly grip, so you got the friction, solid friction catching. So like the one on the upper right, black top with the blue wheels, that's a, a real Australian dolly. Uh, everybody likes them and everybody gets them made and they're quite expensive, but they're, they're very nice uh, because they're quality. But a flat top with a rubber rubber surface, which is a gridded rubber surface, really grips. And of course you can see in the lower right-hand corner of this photograph of the Artex uh, crate on a dolly and you can see the crate setting on the dolly. And that's, that's I think, in this picture, oh, you know, maybe it's rubber. But so many times you'll see it being uh, like a carpeted instead of rubber. But anyway, dollies are worth the money, the quality, mark them so you keep them and take care of them. A lot of times in, in the sites, like on the loading dock or in the in the in the storage where you know, like the prep prep room and stuff, your work room. You can put in hooks on the wall and hang them up, get them out of the way, or, or stack them up so there's 20 in a stack and they're all tied down to one the bottom dolly. And take care of your dollies. The other thing is if you leave heavy things on those dollies for a period of time, the wheel's flat where that weight's sitting on these rubber wheels. No matter even how quality a wheel you got, you'll get that flat spot. So then you'll be pushing something to go to ding, to ding, to ding think as it rolls around. As you've all experienced when you went to buy groceries at the grocery store and you look at you get your shopping cart, you get one of those, it's, it's bad. You're sitting there going around the grocery store, to ding, to ding, to ding, you know, and it just drives me nuts, but everybody stares at you because, you know, you got a bad cart. Anyway, 
So J bars are the great thing because again, they're just the, I call it ancient leverage. I mean, the Egyptians figured out to leverage factor and the longer the bar and strength. And the thing is with J bars, they don't vary around the world. There's not much variance because it's basically, and a lot of people love American made ones because of the oak handle, the oak solid wood handle. There's different hardwoods that work, of course, but the wheels on them are very well made. Uh, there's the steel plate you can see in the bottom of this where it's going under the crate, steel plate. Uh, I couldn't find the picture. I know Archex had these great pictures of there's an extension you can put on them. And a lot of times that's just made, but you can buy that extension. It gives you a little bit extra length on your on your plate that's hooking underneath your crate or your box, so on and so forth. But it's leverage. It's all about the leverage they can do. It saves everybody's backs. Again, like on this one, you put that underneath and one person's pushing down on it, then the dolly can be put underneath the crate. So right there, ergonomics plus. It's an ancient leverage principle. So J bars, don't leave home without them. Then commercial two wheelers. Now commercial two wheelers, uh, you can buy off the shelf. These two, the one on the left is, is just pretty standard. The thing is you gotta buy a quality one and make sure it's rated for the weights you carry. Because for example, you can go to Home Depot buy a cheap one, you go home and you start lifting something, all of a sudden that steel plate's bending. Why do I know that? Because I've bought them before and I've used them at home, then I have to adapt them or just trash them. Now, the heavier the steel plate and the bracing, you can pick up things, durable. And you go to any warehouse anywhere and you see these all over, especially with boxes, box wear, a lot of boxing warehouses or their main product flow is boxes. The one on the right is a is a um, utility truck, and it's very nice because you actually got um, mechanisms you can tie off the track, and it's like appliance dolly, like often term. And then, thanks for the arrow, you go down to the bottom and you see the three wheels. These are made, they're called stair climbers, and you can go up a set of stairs and they go clunk, 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 but the wheels rope rotate and go up the stairs. Otherwise, with the two regular straight two-wheel dolly to the left, you're going clunk, clunk up each step and having to lift it. Stair climbers better. They've came out with more now that have like five wheels and, and they're pretty much transversing over things. I mean, Mark and I were just Mark recently talking about these things crawling over all different things, whether um, you can crawl over a uh, parking curb, so on and so forth. They might have five wheels. Some of them got new hydraulics and pick up and lift the cart over. So anyway, there's things out on the market that are getting better and better, and you keep researching. It might be the perfect need of what you need. Commercial pallet jacks. Now, if you work in a big warehouse and so on and so forth, you're always going to run into the basic principles. Where's the pallet jack at? Where's it being stored? Or is it underneath something? Now you can buy pallet jacks fairly reasonable, but the factors you got to buy in, or you have to consider is the weight capacity of that pallet jack, quality of the wheels running the pallet jack, so on and so forth. But you can get them in longer extensions. You can get them in narrower forks on the, on the pallet jack. So what your need is. So you can go online, pull up the site, or put in your browser pallet jack images. You'll be saying, oh my God, there's zillions of these type of pallet jacks. So quality is very oh. essential. So they will break down. Hold on. So anyway, the, 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 the pallet jacks, their quality will outlast um, anything on this. Uh, the other thing is these two both here are uh, weight, uh, have a scale, set of scales on them. The set of scales is very important to 
because you can go and deal with it, and uh, it's um, so good for measuring um, your load. So oftentimes, I mean, in the old days, we used a platform lift with the, you know, the bar sliding weight to weigh things, but you had to get the object up on the actual lift, on the scales. Now you can put it on a pallet, roll the pallet jack under, lift it up, weigh it, off you go. But then it's great for documenting uh, the situation and so on and so forth. But they're worth the extra money. But again, you got to buy quality because I've seen these things break down when somebody weighs weighs something too, puts something too heavy on it. These are four slides. I'm sorry, but commercial flatbeds. Commercial flatbeds are pretty straightforward. Uh, they come with a wood base. I prefer a wood base on them because you can tie down to them. Also, the one on the right, the fiberglass base. Uh, so you've got those. Those are another commercial. So now we're going to get into more of the hydraulics and things you can buy commercially. And this is one of my favorite, all-time favorite tools in the museum because I can raise things up as a work table, work off of it, unload crates with it in a more ergonomic situation. Also, I can take objects up to the gallery, raise it up, slide them off on the pedestal, or at least get them up high enough where when I'm lifting, I can just lift and turn because I've got it up to level. So hydraulic tables, this is a pump table. You can get them electric. This is a foot manual foot pump tables, I should say. <clears throat> but, they're, but they're great. They're not that expensive. You've got to convince people sometimes of the money you're spending on them. But it's very great. Um, case lifters and lift tables. Case lifters uh, are really great. They come under <clears throat> different names. You'll see this image on to the website. But um, it's, um, you put one on each end of the, like, say, a crate, an example or a case or a cabinet, and uh, you tie them together by the ratchet straps to go to the other one they made up to each other. Then you hydraulically lift it up and you move it. Ergonomic pleasure to move crates with these things, because there's, there's sometimes you just can't be lifting crates all day putting them on dollies. And you get the big crates, which you can't do. So huge advocate of this. You might not use them all the time, but when you got them on hand, you're saving your back. You're saving time. You just got to get people used to using them because you got to take the time to strap them together. And I always got on my staff. I said, put it together. I don't want to hear you complain tonight about lifting crates. Your back's hurting. Put these on, take it on there, and roll it and walk all the way in this long hallway, put it on the freight elevator, move it up to the third floor, whatever, without with just pushing these carts. So anyway, the red on the left is, are these case lifters. See, in the next image on the right, you'll see the two that are tilted. The reason they were tilted because they were originally glass made for moving glass. They're very heavy duty, so we put these uh, tripod wheels on them so we could move them around because they were so, so heavy. But they hydraulically could lift up heavy loads. And, and the arrow, if you move next to the blue table, hydraulic table, of course, the yellow larger table. These are both pump up tables, but they came from different uh, for different uses for different companies. The one on the right, the yellow one, the arrow is pointing to now. It had like a, you know 2,000 pound capacity. Now, did you use it every day? No. But when you went to use it, my God, what a godsend! And it was bought and it was used for that was 20 years used before I got there. Okay, platform lifts uh, and stacker lifts. Now these are very common uh, because, like the one on the left with the, you know the slide with the number three in it, the platform. You can sit there and you pump it up by hand, or maybe there's a lever bar you pump it up with, but it's great. It just lifts things up in place, so on and so forth. The one on on the right is, is a motorized, battery operated. Uh, hydraulic uh, stacker. It's got the different segments, so it's kind of like you're getting close to like the forklift, like a walk behind forklift, but it's not. It's a stacker, and it'll have forks on it. 
we can also put a platform on it to raise things up. This is what a company called Big Joe, which is great. I've used them for years, very quality. And you can control the mechanism, the electronic mechanism. You can control so you get a smooth lift and a smooth stop and start, because mainly with your forklifts and your high electronic, electronic hydraulic lifting mechanism, whether it be a forklift or be these walkie stackers, situations is that jerking motion moving things up and down. So anyway, you buy quality, you make sure you can get them with merging speeds. And if, if you're really concerned about this. Here again, this is a customized frame and stack. You're landing National Gallery of London, the silver framework that's got the painting attached to it is actually like a, a painting card. This is attached to it. But then your pallet stacker slides in and lifts this up. Your counterbalance of the weight on two is balanced out by the weight in the, in the stacker. But you can move that in, lift it up, take it to the wall, put it on the hooks on the wall, unstrap it, move it away. Wonderful, wonderful design. And of course, you can go to the design specific stacker and access support that again, National Guard of London, they have all the Queen's favorite pieces, so it's not like they have a lot of time on their hands. They dream this stuff up. They've just spent the time and money to dream these up, which is, uh, is, a, is just amazing with what they came up with. But these large paintings, how they stately handle it and get it there. You can see the blue is the actual frame card. Again, the person in the middle standing there with a walkie stacker is standing there hydraulically lifting this up. Great idea. And then they came up with the idea, it's like, let's put our, instead of ladders, tall ladders, and standing on a step ladder, laying a ladder up against the wall, they came up with these wonderful carts that you could walk up and reach off of them. And so you got a walking situation. <clears throat> uh, Susan, could you post me on time again, please? Because I know we're getting close. Uh, the walk behind forklift. Now this gets into, again, the hydraulics, battery-operated situation. But uh, this is one we used at the Asian. And this thing was old. but. I mean, it was an amazing machine because we used it for everything because it dealt with our floor loads and we could move it up and down the elevator. There was a walk behind it. It wasn't a step down lift because we just didn't have the space. But we could do a lot with it. We even oftentimes, thanks, Susan, we oftentimes would convert the forks. And we had to do some research, like the one picture on the right, where we converted the forks, the forks instead of being a proper lifting fork in a position, we turned them upside down. Now, we could only, when we talked to the engineers and stuff, we got in this situation where we had to be careful because of the weight load on the end of those tips of those forks and such, because it wasn't engineered like that. But we got to understand that if we turn them upside down, it gave us a different reach. So. As you can see, and as with any forklift, that mast, your center mast that telescopes up, sometimes if if your forks are down in the usual position, you're going to be hitting the ceiling or such with your mast. So in this situation, we turned them upside down so we could raise the top part of that. This is a Tibetan decorative element in there outside the gallery, but <clears throat> we had to put it together because it was part of the exhibition. But we could easily load it and unload it by using the forks inverted in this way. Now, you can see on the back of this walk behind you, manually we'll operate it with a cart much similar to like your power jacks. The hydraulics are in the handle. And basically you have to really it's good to get people trained on them or get the person that's the most, and this goes with forklifts as well, get the person that's most sensible and sensitive to how the machine operates to use the operation because the weight and the counterbalances and many larger lifts 
the hydraulic lift is very heavy. And you put your weight of your object you're carrying or moving, and in your mechanisms of stopping and starting uh, can be very hard sometimes, very slow. And definitely don't go up and down a slope. We had this one, we had to take it in and out. We went out to the outside loading dock, we had to take it down the slope. Never back down, back down the slope because it could roll on your feet, roll on your toes. So we kind of had to slide it down, lower it, let it drag onto the floor. It wasn't a long ramp, but it still was a ramp. But when we needed to go outside to unload something off the truck, that's what we had to do. So you have to learn your capacities, uh, what they can do, and where you're operating on. And Crozier in New York had a horrible dock. We were lifting with a walk behind, lifting loads of plywood off the trucks. And it was, it was a nightmare to see sometimes. But we had to train and get a quality machine. Because if, you, if your brakes give out or something, you immediately roll over. People can get seriously injured with these. But they're great because they go into tight quarters. We'd take this one into storage, lift objects up, <coughs> put them on the shelf. It's very maneuverable. So it worked for our situation where a full forklift would not have worked. So standard, this is a standard LP, what I mean by uh, propane, uh, or the liquid protein, propane uh, forklift. So it wasn't electric, because uh, most of your inside the museum you need an electric powered lift. This is in a warehouse in Australia, in a brand new warehouse. They went out and bought a Clark uh, system, but this is, this is only about three years old, four years old now. But beautiful machine, was spent, money well spent, because in their storage, uh, they were able to put everything up high on power racking, so on and so forth. So the other thing is, looking at the slide on the left, you can see the forks, and then you can see the, the bridge of the back of the forks. Well, this machine and a lot of machines you can get, whether it's walking on or whatever, you can get side motion, you can get side movement control. You lift something up, slide it over a foot, and then move into your space. But you've got control with sliding to the right and to the left. Uh, so this machine had it all. The picture on the right shows, shows um, the controls. I know you can't see it well in this, but when you, if you can blow up this image better, but you, the different controls and the different monitoring system. But this one also had a special, uh, special uh, <clears throat> controls for lower, you know, so you didn't get the jerkiness as you're lifting and also when you're stopping. Again, it's something, if you need this in your situation, especially inside galleries when you do an exhibition install, you need that gentle touch. Okay, it's going to cost you another five thousand dollars to get this mechanism installed inside the equipment and so on and so forth. But, oh my God, it's like it's a dream. And when you're purchasing something like this, bring it out and try it out and see how it is. Sometimes they can adapt <clears throat> the hydraulics on these machines. <clears throat> excuse me to accommodate smoother movement. It's all about the, the oil going into the cylinders and this sort of thing. But talk to them about it, see what they got, then try it out. So especially, again, like I said earlier in this talk, if you've got something you're wanting to purchase and buy, you're spending whatever, five to $40,000, whatever, you're spending the amount of money on it, you should bring it out and try it out. And most equipment dealers, they're going to be more than happy to give you a test drive. It's like driving, buying a used car or buying a new car. Take for a test drive. So now we're going to hit into the extra large stuff, and we're going into gantry cranes. Gantry cranes are something you have to know how to use. You can train people on how to use them, so on and so forth. But when you're actually using, get the best person in on it because it's a huge safety issue. It's like on gantries, people say, well, i got to lock the wheels before I lift. But when you lift that load up, 
with your chain hoist, as you can see in the middle of the green strap, as soon as that object's lifted off the ground, the weight can shift. You have to leave the wheels unlocked. And when we did demonstrations, whether it's packing or whether, like this is a picture during an Artex training session, when you lift that object up, you know, you can play with it and show how these things will jump and skip. And years ago, back in the early 90s, when I was first in the business in Nelson Atkins Museum, we were doing a job overseas. It was coming with the National Trust in London and, and working with Fine Arts Express years ago, that company called Fine Arts Express. We were going into Turkey to bring out a bunch of old Roman statues and stuff. They'd never been taken out, so on and so forth. It was a historic site over there, whatever. But the first thing the guy asked me from Fine Arts Express, he goes, so tell me what your experience with using a gantry. And I said, well, they kind of scared me to death because I've got to constantly, and he goes, that's all I need to hear. You're, you're paying attention to the problem. And, you know, in packing, we, we do these training workshops uh, in um, other situations on site. You know, get somebody to do the training, get the training, and then get somebody that specifically uh, is the team leader for when things need to be rigged. It's like these two people from Artex here, they're the riggers. Got you know, years of experience just trust them and the safety factor is tremendous instead of just letting everybody and their brother go out and use it. The same issue on a forklift. Everybody wants to ride the forklift. Everybody wants to drive the forklift. Why? Because it's like a big toy, okay? Just admit it. It's like a big tack tractor toy. But the thing is you have to have your protocols, your training, your procedures, and some people are just better at operating a forklift and machine than others. I've had staff furious with me because I was, you know, they were having to move the crates up the forklift. But I had my main forklift person or myself running the machine. You know, and everybody's tired. They're moving. I said, well, why, why can't I run the machine? I say, because you don't have the touch, period. And he also, I'm working with these big machines, or the forklift, walk behind stackers, so on and so forth. You've got to realize the world around you, the environment. So you got to have that extra radar sense. And the people that are just standing there directing traffic and or working with you also need that. So